so I've got the uh, real graveyard shift, haven't I? <laughs> so I'm, I really um, don't intend to keep you uh, very long for this, but what I'm going to do is present this project on deposit modelling, which we've been working on over the last year, and there's been a great introduction already this morning on some principles of um, deposit modelling or some applications. This is very much a sort of English-centric view, I must uh, sort of say, because it's funded by Historic England. And so we're developing a set of guidelines for application uh, across England, but I hope the principles that I'm going to discuss actually are quite generic and have application across um, many different environments and areas. So how I'm going to break this down, I'm going to quickly describe what a deposit model is. Um, I'm not trying to teach you to suck eggs, but you never know, there might be somebody here thinking, gosh, I've really got no idea what, what is meant by this term deposit model. We'll have a look at the project rationale. And we'll have then a look at the current view of what is deposit modelling and have a look at some of the outcomes from this project. Um, one of the things we're doing is we're pulling together a lot of previously unpu uh, unpublished studies into a technical monograph. And I'm currently um, going through the editing process of this and I shamelessly have cribbed pictures from this throughout. <laughs> so uh, if one of yours pops up, I'm not trying to rip it off, I just needed something to illustrate this talk because I was putting it together yesterday. So what is a deposit model? Well, I'm sure here everybody knows, and if they don't know the term, they certainly know the principles. But I think as geoarchaeologists and as archaeologists, we need to think carefully about the sorts of environments that archaeological remains are kept in, housed in. And when I teach this to undergraduates, I break this down into two very generic, very distinct environments. The first of which are ones that vertically accrete. They build upwards. Sediments laterally build up. And I call this um, vertically accreting sediments, deep sediments, things that are greater than, say, a metre, a metre or more. Um, classic examples, alluvial wetlands, things like this. And I think we can converse or, or, or compare those to what I call static topographic templates. Now, these are the dryland sites where we have features that are cut into bedrocks, where we just have shallow soil profiles above them. And I think there's a very, very distinct difference between the types of archaeological remains we find in these different environments and also how as archaeologists we have to investigate them. Now this is significant. Why? Because if an archaeologist wants to find archaeologist, uh, archaeology, sorry, they will use things like aerial photography, gradiometer survey, field walking, these standard prospection techniques. But these standard prospection techniques just aren't going to work in environments that have built up over time. The second reason it's significant is because these deep sediment sequences preserve archaeological remains. They preserve them exceptionally well. Things like waterlogging are prevalent. So we have a richer archaeological resource that we want to investigate. And the third really big issue then, which comes with these vertically accreted environments, is that certainly from a commercial um, perspective, they're more expensive to excavate. They're more complex to excavate and they're more time consuming. So we can't really compare these two different environments directly like to like. They're quite distinct and quite difficult. So if we accept that we have this very generic distinction between these two types of environments, why is a deposit model necessary? Well, if we have these deep vertically accreting sediments, we can't access the archaeology directly. We can't um, take a GPR survey across five metres of alluvial sediments and expect to be able to find a house. It's just not going to work. So what we have to do is we have to access the sediments and use these as a proxy of archaeological potential. Now to do this, we can access these sediments using a whole range of techniques. So we can do it by proxy, electrical resistivity, comb penetration tests, or we can do it by boreholes. We can access the sediments directly and log those. And I'm sure these are techniques that we're all um, directly familiar with. So I've just put a couple of examples, uh, which we'll all be familiar with, boreholes at the top, and some extrapolated cross-sections at the bottom <coughs> from these boreholes. But what we're doing is we're actually obtaining information on the subsurface sediment architectures because we want to identify things such as geomorphological units, buried gravel islands, buried terraces, land surfaces, paleosols, etc. So that's what we're doing. We're not detecting archaeologically di uh, archaeology directly. We are modelling subsurface sediments to use that as a proxy of archaeological potential. Now, within the project, we decided that a key feature of a deposit model 
was that we needed to use more than one set of data or one piece of data to create a prediction about the subsurface environment. So that was really our definition of what a deposit model would be. But this can range directly, uh, sorry, this can really range in the degree of complexity of the data sets that we're using. So I think we're all pretty familiar with these principles then of deposit modeling. Um, it seemed time to really pull together lots of different experiences from all around the country um, into synthesizing a new set of guidelines into what deposit modeling actually was. Lots of people are doing deposit modeling, but they're doing it in their own way. And we needed to really integrate these different approaches and see what was working and what wasn't. So very fortunately, Historic England decided to fund this project. And the purpose is, is to bring together these shared experiences to provide some um, synthesis of pre-existing models and then to write a new set of national guidelines from this. Now currently, and I think unbelievably, um, in Britain, we don't have any current guidelines for doing this sort of work. Now this is baffling to me because it's probably the most utilised geoarchaeological method, certainly within the commercial archaeological sector. There are, there are lots of guidelines, for example, on how we would undertake mitigation excavation, evaluate, ex, uh, evaluation excavation and so forth, but nothing upon this deposit modelling stage. And this is even more concerning because if you apply the principles of deposit modelling correctly, you can certainly reduce a lot of your archaeological evaluation trenching where you're going to find very little, um, and then put that money and those costs and those resources into targeting areas where you have good archaeology. So you're going to improve the quality of your archaeological yield. And there has been, up to this point, no real discussion then of what these methods are of um, deposit modelling. So what did we do? We asked people like Mark and Virgil to come together and we had a big workshop and we discussed a series of um, predetermined issues in roundtable discussions and we captured the views of the deposit modellers. We also synthesised a range of case studies into a monograph. And I was hoping I'd have the monograph here ready for publication to distribute to you all, um, but I'm still editing it, it seems to go on forever. However, um, it is freely available. So we, yeah, Historic England are publishing the print run, they're paying for that, so it's a free copy. And the reason is, is to get this data and this information out there for everybody. But I did hope to get it ready in time for this conference, but failed miserably. And um, to my knowledge, it was the first time when we ran this workshop that geoarchaeologists had come together and kind of discussed these issues of deposit modelling. And this was seen to be a very sort of welcome um, step by the deposit modelling uh, community. So what did we learn? Well, slightly unsurprisingly, deposit modelling is undertaken on a whole range of sites. Some are very small, some are very big, and everything in, in between. I think certainly on the very large um, scale, this is extremely important especially in Britain when we have projects like HS2 on the horizon. It includes all sorts of environments, so alluvial, colluvial, perimarine, we've heard lots about those, and also, and significantly, urban environments as well. In terms of methods that we use to make these models of subsurface environments, we seem to split it along two, two lines, either the sort of the GIS um, methods at the top which will um, model surfaces, that will model interfaces. It won't uh, model the sediments per se, it models the interfaces between sediments in a sort of uh, top-down two-dimensional view. And we can contrast that to Rockworks which tries to do a pseudo three-dimensional view and actually models the solid sediment body. And there's quite a significant difference between those two sorts of applications. Um, Deposit modelers most commonly use borehole data. I don't think that's a surprise to us, but most often they're using historical records, not purposive boreholes. And as I mentioned previously, we use lots of other methods alongside this, such as GPR, cane penetration tests, and so forth. So from this, what are our outcomes of getting everybody together? Well, the first one, and I think we should all be alarmed as this, or by this as geoarchaeologists, is there is no central repository for geoarchaeological data. And this is why I welcome projects such as the Bastille Channel, where there is data sharing. So what we were finding is that people would commission some boreholes, maybe that site would go dead, five years later there'd be another phase of work, and then be another set of recommissioned boreholes, or another set of geotech data, or whatever it is. 
uh, being undertaken on this site. Now this is, um, I say, extremely worrying for geoarchaeologists because archaeologists, well, we have to put a repository of data together, don't we? And we have to give this to the county archaeologists. This just isn't happening for the geoarchaeologists. <coughs> now you might be lucky and you might know of the person who um, investigated that site or the company, but unless you have that knowledge to hand, this data is inaccessible. Now this is certainly a problem when we have small sites, small parcels of land to develop, but when we're trying to analyse entire landscapes and it's being done in a very piecemeal way, where are we getting all this data to be able to synthesise and create landscape-based models? And the answer is we're not, except for where we have one or two very pioneering projects, most of this data is being lost. And I think as geoarchaeologists we all need to think about that. Okay, secondly, in terms of deposit modelling, there really is a variable uptake across the commercial archaeological sector. Some of the big units, such as Wessex, such as Oxford, have their own in-house geoarchaeology teams and actively promote deposit modelling as the vehicle for their mitigation programmes. But other um, smaller consultancies just don't have the resources and they just don't have the knowledge base to do this sort of work. So depending upon which archaeological unit or, or consultancy is undertaking the development of an area, we might have completely contrasting approaches. That's exceptionally worrying when we have these very deep um, sediment sequences because the, the wrong techniques here can produce very, very, um, a very, very high amount of waste of resources. Okay, number four, deposit models have a key role to play in um, archaeological schemes, large ar ar archaeological schemes, and often archaeologists are not familiar with them. <coughs> now again, um, this might sound obvious, but it should be of concern to us. Um, I sat across the room from the HS2 lead for the, um, environments, uh, for the environmental programme there, and they hadn't heard of deposit modelling, and were very much thinking that a sort of geophysical survey across the route of HS2 would be a sufficient um, start for their mitigation programme, which I considered to be really um, not appropriate for the route that they were suggesting. Now, of course, that's just a very um, obvious and brief overview, but we have to get this information and this set of methods out for people to be familiar with and utilise. So it becomes common parlance, such as um, evaluation, <coughs> excavation, and mitigation, and so forth. Now, with this, as a group of academics sat here, HE has got to be playing a driving role in this. It's all very well saying that oh, the commercial sector might not always do things correctly and so forth. Um, in terms of deposit modelling, where are students, the, tomorrow's archaeologists, going to learn about deposit modelling? Well, of course, it's from their archaeological de uh, degree programmes, at least to start with. Now, I'm not aware of any um, undergraduate or masters that really does in terms of geoarchaeology sediment deposit modelling. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is something that we need to think about. Okay, another key issue that comes out is there sometimes confusion in the archaeological sector about what is the deposit model and then what is the field excavation. And this, this directly relates back to number five, in that we might have archaeological um, field excavators being slightly confused about what the deposit, mean, the deposit model means for them in terms of their excavation, how those two things dovetail together. Again, it might sound obvious, but we need, as geoarchaeologists, to be really proactive in uniting our models with the archaeological field reality. And I think a lot of that is going around and seeing what people are excavating and talking to them about very basic things sometimes about what this sediment body is and what a sediment actually is. Um, number seven, whole range of techniques applied to create deposit models. Nobody's really evaluated which of them are any good. Are they all, do they all work? Are they all rubbish or so forth? There's been no cr real critical evaluation. And I want to come back to this later um, because I think there's, there's an onus on us as geoarchaeologists to consider this in more detail. But we needed to really start evaluating what was working. Um, and maybe, and I think here I talked about, maybe I didn't, um, not failures but partial successes. We need to say what, what partially went right there. Now, if you get a group of geoarchaeologists uh, geoarchaeologists together and ask them is geoarchaeology the most important thing you can do on a site, of course they're going to say yes. <laughs> but I think this is important that the deposit models that we create should be the vehicle for our mitigation programmes. 
They have to come at the start of the process. There is no point creating a model towards the end, or there is less point in creating a model towards the end. If you create the model at the upfront stage in your project, then you can base your evaluation strategy on that. From your evaluation strategy, you can move straight to your mitigation strategy. In fact, on some projects, I've pretty much done away with evaluation and move straight into mitigation. This focuses resources on what we want to be excavating. Um, number nine, number nine. I think there's only 10, you'll be relieved to hear. Um, a deposit model must make a statement about archeological risk. It's all very well producing lovely models about changes in post-glacial landscapes and Mesolithic rivers and then um, Bronze Age sedimentation and all the rest of it. But actually in the commercial archeological sector, what do the curators want to know? What does the developer want to know? And they want to know what is their archeological risk? And that is what your deposit model is defining. And this is sort of basically, these two images here are showing this sort of thing. This is the zonation of archeological risk based on deposit model. And then here's a very limited evaluation strategy, which isn't testing whether there's archeology span there because the deposit model effectively tells me there's lots of archeology span here. It's just showing me what the types of archeology span are. This was 44 hectares and I think we excavated 40 eval trenches in it. The reason being, we're going to move straight into a strip um, and excavation. Um, so we're going to strip that site directly and move straight into excavation. Okay, so future comments. Where are we going with this? Well, deposit models, unsurprisingly, have been frequently used in the commercial ar uh, archaeological sector, and often that is dovetailing into the academic sector. I think we as geoarchaeologists are becoming so much better at understanding how to deal with complex three-dimensional environments. But what we also need to do with our increased understanding is maximise our field excavation techniques to maximise our archaeological yield. There is no point in us creating beautiful models and then not applying the principles of the model in the archaeological excavation. Successes and failures, the limited uh, excesses need to be reported. It's just not sexy. If I was to submit a paper to geoarchaeology, um, it would be rejected when I say I produced a you know, deposit model, it was totally rubbish and we found nothing. <laughs> no thanks. But we have to have a vehicle for saying, right, why didn't this work? Um, how, you know, how was the deposit model constructed and why did it not work? And this is the sort of data that's just not out there because, of course, it's not publishable. Most of my papers aren't publishable. <laughs> that's another story. Okay. And lastly is that we need more published examples of archaeological deposit models against the realities. So this is an example here. Um, this is a, uh, just published a few months ago. It's the Lug Valley in, in um, Worcestershire, I think it is. And basically, here's my risk map. Here are my different geomorphological zones. I put a trench and eval strategy against this at 3, 2, and 1%. Now, the county archaeologist wanted a 5% sample strategy for eval. I said, this is hopeless, total waste of money. But what we will do is we'll take that money We'll create you a deposit model, and then we'll test that model. And in areas where I thought there was low archaeology, we did 1%, intermediate we did 2%, and in areas of high, archae high archaeological potential, we did 3%. Now, of course, you're going to say that's a self-reinforcing structure. If you do 3% where you think there's archaeology, you're going to find more archaeology. But of course, 3% of a large area is still a tiny fraction. And what we found anyway is that where we thought there'd be archaeology, we found lots of archaeology, a lovely middle Bronze Age settlement up here. And in the areas where we thought um, from our deposit model intimated there wouldn't be any archaeology, we found effectively next to nothing. Now what we did is we took that saving and we put that into creating a deposit model and overall we, we um, saved the clients some money, but we focused our resources on where the good archaeology is. And I think this is exactly the sort of thing we need to be publishing now as a sector. I think it's really time we need to Reevaluate evaluation trenching. Dryland environments, we've got fantastic vehicles of prospection. And in wetland environments, or these vertically increased environments, we're utilising deposit modelling. I think that means we need to reevaluate our thoughts about archaeological process. Right, everyone's dying for coffee. I'm going to stop mm -hmm. yabbering on. Done.